Conference. And so this evening we have a very exciting agenda ahead of us to discuss the cycling and road upgrades for College Street. Uh, we have a fantastic team with us, so I will introduce you to team members, but just to lay out our plan for this evening. Um, for the most part, we're going to take you through a detailed presentation of the, the safety upgrades that are going to be made to the cycling and pedestrian realm. And then we've got a healthy chunk of time set aside in order to be able to answer questions of clarity or any other project related questions that you have. So I'll let you know who we have with us this evening and who is taking you through this presentation. From Transportation Services, um, we, the team that is helping to put this project together consists of Becky Katz, David Dunn, and Kastra. Unfortunately, Becky couldn't be with us this evening, but we do have Sonia who will also help to speak to some of your questions from the Public Consultation Unit. Again, my name is Adila Valiella and I am facilitating the public consultation process. I'm taking you through the facilitating the presentation this evening and I will also be your contact person if you have any questions or comments and you need to contact me after this presentation over the course of the next few weeks. And I see Becky has joined us. Good evening, Becky. We also have with us this evening, uh, Michael Vieira, and we are expecting Diego Senagoa and Christian Nailapia to join us as well. They are from the TTC. Um, and we have a team of staff you can probably see on your screen from the Public Consultation Unit to help us capture all of your questions as we may not be able to get through them all tonight and to make sure that we are able to record um, other comments that come through and follow up with responses for you. I will at this point hand over to David Dunn to take you through the details of the college pedestrian and cycling upgrades. Thank you, Adila. Uh, so I'll start by giving a quick overview of why we're doing the project now. Uh, in 2022, there's a TTC track replacement work plan between college, on College Street between Bathurst and Bay Street. And, and as part of this is TTC track work that's um, required to ensure the longevity of the streetcar system and do say to repair, good repair work. And so as part of these types of projects, uh, Transportation Services uh, it has been directed by Council to take a complete streets approach and as part of state good pair programs. And uh, so that's why this project, the TTC track work, gives us the opportunity to make some other modifications to College Street uh, to add separated bikeways and improve safety for all road users. So the next. So the project description, sorry, I didn't realize that it slide had gone forward. Uh, as you see in the red line on the, the image on your right, that's the limits of the TTC track work from Bathurst Street to Bay. Uh, the existing bike lanes go from Manning to Bay. So uh, as part of this project, we're proposing to make some upgrades between Manning and Spadina where uh, there's existing current uh, parking bays uh, and also between Spadina and Bay where uh, and where there's uh, there is no parking so it's a little bit different design so we, we're going to consider and I'll, I'll go through in the, the later slides on the two different sections so we'll, we'll think of it as two sections Manning to Spadina and then Spadina to Bay um, and as of this as part of this work we're going to propose not just uh, improvements to the cycling infrastructure, but also uh, proposing some raised cross crossings uh, for pedestrians at the cross streets and planted ball boats, uh, and also potentially uh, improvements to the existing trees on the corridor. So the goals of the project, three goals, improve safety for people cycling and walking is, is the primary goal, and also to encourage uh, 
that cycling and walking by improving the bikeway and making the street more pleasant. Uh, while making those improvements, we'd also the, the goal would also be to to continue and help support the local business by maintaining the parking supply, increasing parking, uh, and creating college as a destination area. So I'll go through some of the, the, the many reasons why we're going to consider these changes. Uh, just as a, an overall overarching, there, there's many uh, city official plan goals, road health safety, um, um, road to health. Um, there's, there's many uh, policies and programs. So uh, official plan goals, road to health, Vision Zero, which I'll talk about a little bit later, uh, transform TO climate change strategy, uh, just the general complete streets guidelines, uh, a reduction in the reliance on motor vehicles, uh, encouraging all people of all ages and abilities to ride, and, you know, plan for recovery and rebuilding from the COVID-19. So, in 2016, and then uh, a cycling network plan was developed, and then um, uh, an addendum to it in 2019, and the, the three pillars to that cycling network plan is uh, to connect, grow, renew. So connect existing gaps in the in the cycling infrastructure to grow and expand the network, and to renew or to uh, upgrade the existing cycling network that we already have. So again, since the, there's existing bike lanes on College Street Net right now, we're in that that renew pillar where we're going to make improvements to the existing infrastructure infrastructure. So just to give you a little bit of background on the existing travel patterns in this area for uh, the former Ward 11, um, or sorry, the former uh, Ward 20, now Ward 11, it was uh, from the Transportation Tomorrow Survey, the, the existing, uh, there's about 68% of the trips in the neighborhood are taken by either foot, bike, or transit, and uh, there's a considerable amount of, you know, cycling trips, 17,600 per day, 70,000 walking trips per day, and 46,000 people travel by transit. This is, College Street is historically one of the busiest cycling corridors in the city at, uh, during the summer months with 6,800 cycling trips a day, and in the, even in the winter, Winter, up to 2,500 cycling trips per day. So as I mentioned before, with the overarching policies, one of the, the key ones is the Vision Zero Safety Plan, which is a bold pledge to improve safety across the city. Uh, the primary goal is to is that traffic fatalities are preventable and that that no uh, loss of life or serious injuries are acceptable. So what we try and do is to be proactive and design, do a design that prevents collisions that would result in serious injuries or fatalities. Next. Uh, also, as I mentioned in, in the previous slide, the Transform TO is to reduce the reliance on automobiles and help reduce the, uh, the greenhouse gas emissions in, in, that, in, in a way so that the goal of that plan is to reduce the, the number of trips uh, that using those uh, modes of transportation that, that, that create the greenhouse gases, so to encourage the, the number of trips by cycling or walking uh, to be account for 75% of the trips uh, under five kilometers by the, the year 2050. Right now in, in, the, in the citywide, it's about 37% of the trips are now five kilometers or less, and the way to do that would be to re re redesign the streets to improve safety and comfort for people cycling and walking. So when we do these designs, we, we, we look to the um, design guidelines, the Transportation Association of Canada, geometric design guides, the Ontario Traffic Manual OTM design, and our own design guidelines. And those guidelines, usually the, the primary, um, those primary criteria for what type of cycling infrastructure we should design for is based on speed and volume. Uh, the current speeds and volumes on this section of calling between Manning and Spadina is about 24,000 vehicles a day and with a posted speed of 40 kilometers an hour. And as you can see by the, the chart from OTM on that's on the right, uh, the green line is the 40 kilometer hour speed limit and the green dot that's pretty much off the charts because it's, it's higher than the 10,000 vehicles per day at, at 24,000 vehicles per day, you know, shows that the recommended uh, bikeway design for the section of College Street would be a physically separated bikeway or cycle track. 
Another reason why we consider changes is, is in the section between Manning and Spadina, a lot of the parking is in parking bays, which in the wintertime creates difficulties for snow clearing. You can see in the image on the right, uh, with the, the parking in the bays, it's very difficult to get the snow clearing equipment in. The snow gets packed down, hard to remove, and as you see by the, the red line, so it's outlined, the, the cars are end up getting pushed further and further out, so the the cycling facility is is blocked by the cars that have no other uh, no other place to park except for in the bike lane because the the windrows are are so difficult to um, to clear. So uh, the the hopefully in in our design we're going to make modifications to the street so that we can um, improve the the ability to clear the snow and to keep the cycle track clear. That we also, as as part of our uh, doing the redesign, we 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 look to um, realizing the community's vision. So we looked at the uh, the 2015 Harbor Village Green Plan, which identified uh, opportunities for side street flankages along College Street uh, uh, in the whole neighborhood. That that you know greening the neighborhood, but College specifically flankages on Lipping Cot on the East West, Borden Street, Brunswick Street, Major and Robert. So we use that to, to help guide, you know, some of the, the other improvements besides the bike lanes that we wanted to, that we're, we're making improvements to. Next. And uh, so that's a Harvard Rillage is, is in one section, but uh, but further to the West, there's also the, the, the Palmerston Area Residents Association also have a green plan that was adopted in 2020. And while it doesn't specify specific improvements at locations, but they, they do specify, you know, in support for increased cycling infrastructure uh, and also uh, supporting uh, increase in tree planting along the major corridors, including College Street. Um, and as part of, uh, I believe this is the last, uh, last part in the why consider changes. In 2020, Council also approved on the section between uh, Borden and Bellevue a, a project in order to help uh, facilitate that connection from the existing contraflows on, on Bellevue to the proposed and now approved uh, contraflow on, on Borden to help that north-south connection. So this was scheduled for, for construction at, in 2021, but uh, we're tapering it to coordinate with this construction. So it's uh, coordinating the construction and the, the principles of this design, expanding it to the other sections east and west of uh, the Borden-Bellevue uh, area. So now, let me grab a quick drink, and I'll, then I'll describe some of the design features. Thank you. So the design features and principles. First, the principles that you know, some of the the principles being that the streets are public spaces. They're not just for transportation. They're they places that you want people to come and gather, that, uh, you know, you create a great street or a street that people want, it, it helps and uh, attract people to and um, uh, help support businesses in the area. And uh, also that streets can transform. There, a lot of them were built in that previous era. And as, as things change, you know, the streets and change and the character of the street changes. Um, and again, the principle of, of improving and designing for safety, as well as the fact that it's not just hard surface that, that we're looking at improving and, and facilities. It's also that streets are an ecosystem and, and you know, we have to pr help provide and support, you know, improved green infrastructure too. So some of the design features are considering from the pedestrian perspective is raised pedestrian crossings. So these would be crossings instead of it being at a normal cross street of, of college, they go down at the street level. So you step down off the curb and onto the street. So in these locations at the cross streets, we're considering doing what we call raised crossing so that the sidewalk level through the cross street stays at the same level at the sidewalk level. And so that the cars, they basically have to ramp up and down. So that helps reinforce slow speeds, um, and it helps people driving yield to people walking. Uh, another feature it, to, to help improve the pedestrian environment would be curb extension. So uh, the part in yellow that you see there is to you, you widen out uh, into the cross street to, to shorten the, the pet cro pedestrian crossing distances. Uh, and we, we also, as we do that, we can reduce the curb rate to help the, so the, the turning movement of the, 
the turning angle of the of the of the corners to help reduce the turning speeds also so that you know, also helps improve pedestrian safety next so the design feature of the bikeway as i mentioned in in the chart before is that the recommended design is a is a, a cycle track or a separate physically separated this definition of the cycle track is a physically separated uh, bike facility so in in the case of the the picture on the right there it's separated by a curb it's at street level but other forms of separation are raising it to a different level of the the, the motor vehicle lanes is also um, a form of separation and all of those help distinguish a very specific area for cycling uh, that is separate from the motor vehicles uh, the other design features we're, we're going to incorporate in there, or looking to incorporate in design, are the transit upgrades. So, uh, transit platforms, uh, as you see in the image on the right, the, these are raised platforms. So, the cycling area is is raised as you go through. It will clearly define an area where the cyclists are and where the pedestrians are when they when the cyclists uh, are passing. That you know, they, they it's delineated so that the, the pedestrians or the, the transit users know uh, where to stand while it's a cycling facility. And then that there are waiting areas uh, in in front of the the platform. So when the streetcar or bus does come, that the cyclists are are yield to the pedestrians as they cross the at the platform and to board. So I'll get into some more specifics about the design. Uh, as, again, as I said earlier, it's split off into two separate sections. The Manning to Spadina section I'll talk about first. Uh, the roadway uh, is 20 meters wide with, uh, as I said before, existing bike lanes are painted there with uh, two vehicle lanes in each direction with the TTC running down the middle of those. Posted speed limit's 40 kilometers an hour. Um, on this section specifically, motor vehicle volumes are 24,000 per day, with cycling volumes at 6,800 and pedestrian volumes at about 11,000. Uh, on this section of those uh, 28 uh, um, serious uh, collisions that resulted in either a fatality or serious injury, there were 20, uh, and those were over the last 10 years. On street parking, it, or in parking bays, with the transit route being the 506 streetcar route with platforms at Bathurst Street and the east side of Spadina Avenue. Uh, a little bit more on the, the, fate, the, the serious and fatal collisions. There were, uh, as I said before, 20 in, on this stretch. Uh, they're mostly at the intersections with the, the two fatalities that so were at mid-block between uh, just uh, east of Manning and uh, just east of Palmerston. So these are images of uh, the, the one on the the image on the left, and is the section between Mas Manning and Bathurst, and the 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 image on the right, uh, I believe, is an image from the the section from Bathurst to Spadina. Both are very similar, uh, with the as I said the the parking bays with the bike lane beside it, and the two lanes of traffic in each direction. So this is another um, a way of looking at it. We call it the, the cross section of it is uh, again streetcars in the middle, lanes beside. Uh, on this image, you don't quite see that the the parking bays, uh, but the, that's the the width we have to work with is is goes to that area for accommodating the cycling facility and the the parking and the lanes of traffic. So on the image bo on below, you see that we the in the area where the parking bays were, that's where the new cycling facilities can be with a buffer. Uh, in between the um, the cycling facility and the cars, uh, it's not that easy to see on this image, but it's a raised cycle track, so it's at the sidewalk level, uh, not at the street level. Now the so it's a it's an elevated cycle track again. Both lane lanes in each direction are going to be maintained with the TTC still going down the middle. The new curb line is going to be approximately in the location where the bike lane line was before. So all those lanes in the middle will maintain the same. The only difference is now that the, the parking, which was in the parking bays, as you can see in this image, is going to be moved out to beside the curb. And so uh, during the, and it will work like the section now that is west of Manning, where during the peak period, so the rush hours in the morning and the afternoon, cars won't be allowed to park at the curb and will improve the flow of the traffic in that time so that it will be when the, the traffic is heaviest, the, the, the traffic will flow 
as it does now with the four lanes. In the off-peak period where the traffic is lighter, that's where the, the parking will be permitted at the curb lane. Uh, this configuration uh, will still allow for CAFATO installations uh, that, that have been um, that have been uh, accommodated in this year and last year in the parking bays. Uh, they will still be permitted. Same thing though in the the in the the areas in the curb lane. And so because now that uh, the difference being now they will have to cross the cycle track to get to the cafes, but we will enhance uh, the those locations with uh, pavement markings crossing the cycle track where the cafe TO locations would be. So this, uh, this shows um, the top being what's proposed and the bottom what's existing. So as you can see on the existing, the, the, the red line, uh, sorry, the, the curb line matches up with where the, uh, the new curb line on the top matches up where the, the, the old lane line was. Uh, and so the, the green area is the cycle track and the, the, the gray area in that image is the buffer in between the cycle track. Uh, it's still at the same level as the cycle track, but the, the buffer is needed for uh, the when the cycle track is next to the parking or the parking is, is beside the curb next to a cycle track. Uh, there's a space required for the door swing of those parked cars so that they, the door swing doesn't open up into the cycle track. So that would be about uh, uh, a meter wide to allow for the door swing and for people to get out without stepping directly, get out of their vehicles without stepping directly onto the cycle track. The other improvement we're going to make, as I, as I mentioned before, is that the we're going to improve the, um, the TTC stops by creating raised platforms. Um, in the condition now, they're there is no platform, but the TTC requires 30 meter platforms. Uh, so right now that the ball boats and, and the location of the parking is inside of that 30, so 30 meters. So what will happen is as we construct them, that, that parking won't be allowed inside of inside of that area for where the platform will be. Uh, it will improve safety in, the, in those locations because now the, the people boarding from you know, the, the rear doors don't have to go through the, the parked cars are in some situations where the, the, the stops are uh, don't have a lot of room behind them until the, the, the parking starts. So this provides the room so that people can board uh, uh, freely through through and to the doors without being obstructed by any cars parked there. Although this may, rec sorry, and the, this image down here, sorry, I'll, I'll talk about it, sorry, on the, on the next image, thank you. So this image shows it's similar to the one previously where the again the the parking gets pushed to the outside but as you can see on this image where uh, and some of them are much closer uh, where the the 30 meters for the new platform extends into the location where the parking is uh, so in some of these locations because the the width of the cycle track uh, or the the platforms in in some of these cases requires uh, a uh, a width for the the, the band and uh, uh, the drainage. The the green dashed line there is is a is a trench drain that that uh, that would be required in order to uh, to to have the water drain there. But it's also uh, because it's a streetcar platform. There's a, a one meter band that needs to be permitted that provided on the inside. So that's why you see where the curb line is has to be pushed back a little bit more because it the, that that existing width is only 1.6 meters and it requires the width for the both the cycle track and um, a ramp so that people can go can can ramp up onto the uh, the, the sidewalk level from the streetcar because it, it's a bus pulls up other locations that you may see there's no ramps but that's their bus locations where the bus will pull directly up and load directly onto the platform but in this case with the streetcars and the median uh, there's a curb cut required uh, on the platform location, which requires a little bit more width than platforms that you might see in other locations where it's bus only. So as I said, they because we were pushing back the parking, the, there will be a loss of parking on the on the corridor. This this slide uh, goes over the amount of parking that's lost. So the the TTC stops are indicated with the TTC symbols there, and that's why where you'll see the uh, 
the biggest change in the parking because uh, of the expansion from the the existing uh, bow boat locations to provide that 30 meters. But overall, there's 144 spaces there, and based on our what our preliminary design has right now, that we're going to maintain 117 spots, or at least 80 80 plus percent of the the parking that's there now will be retained. So as we're doing this, we're also going to make sure that the pedestrian accessibility is, is maintained. So uh, at the cross streets, we're going to make sure that uh, all the standards for providing tactile warning strips at the intersections. As I said before, we're going to provide raised intersections at at, uh, at some of the cross streets, and we're going to look at opportunities for tree plantings uh, and uh, greening the corner areas. Uh, We'll start with the, at least looking at the, the locations that were already identified in the HVR plan at, plan at Lippincott, Borden, Brunswick, Major, and Robert, but it's not limited to those streets. We're going to look at, uh, at, uh, at the sections uh, also east of Bath, or sorry, west of Bathurst also, and the HVR plan only really uh, considers the locations on the north side, so we're going to look at both the north side and the south side, not just uh, the locations that were identified in the HVR plan on the north side of college. So we'll also look at the existing trees um, and as part of the construction, because we're even though we're going on the inside of the bays, uh, we do have to rebuild the, the curb area there and we'll go into some of the details um, and, and the, the photos that will come uh, in the next slides, you can see better, but the curb has to be reconstructed, and so that, that does give us the opportunity that sometimes we, we may be able to increase the soil volume and increase the environment where the trees are to improve the soil volume to, you know, provide a healthier environment for the trees if we can. Uh, also, if there is the opportunities, it, it may be difficult because they, the areas are just in the corner flankages where there's, there, there's typically sight line issues, but we will lo look at opportunities for planting any additional trees where we can. So these are the images that, um, that I was referring to. Uh, so even though I said it is raised, um, these are examples of the the a raised cycle track that we did on Bloor Street, which is similar. Um, these pictures are around the, the Brunswick area, I believe. So the parking in this case is, is permanent next to the curb, but it would be similar, uh, as you can see in the picture on the right, with the cars parked next to it. Uh, and the, the curb and, and the detail uh, I want to focus on in these images is that it's not, um, the sidewalk level isn't the same. Even though it's raised, it's not totally flush with the sidewalk. The, the curb that you see on the image on the right, it's a, it's a beveled curb. It's, it's designed that way to create a, um, an edge that is, um, that is cane detectable for people with low vision that are on the sidewalk so that they know that the, not to, uh, that, that, the, that area there is, is not a pedestrian area, it's a cycling area because the, again, with people with low vision, that it's a tactile uh, surface and it's, um, we have done them in different areas where in the city where it is is flush or burn example uh, where they do uh, a a decorative strip next to it which is also tactile but uh, the studies have shown that this type of treatment is uh, more detectable for somebody with the low low vision that is using a cane to detect it. These are some examples of the side street uh, the treatments we could do. It's not exactly like this, but uh, you know, greening up the corner areas and providing some some different, uh, uh, in this case, bike parking uh, or decorative pavers on, on the uh, on the ball boat areas. So now I'll, I'll describe the, the, the second section uh, between Spadina and Bay, which will be a street level cycle track with. Uh, with a, a port in place curb or cast in place curb. So on this section, uh, the curb to curb width isn't as wide. There's no parking bays. So the, the curb to curb width is only 16 and a half meters, still bike lanes on both sides and the, the same lane configuration with the two lanes and the TTC streetcar and the median, same posted speed. Vehicle volumes are a little bit higher at 25,600 per day and uh, cycling volumes 3,900, pet volumes 12,000. Uh, on this section, there weren't nearly as many um, killed and seriously injured, KSIs, there were only eight in the last 10 years. And on this section, there's no parking permitted uh, for the entire section from uh, Spadina to Bay. 
one last point was that uh, sorry I missed that the uh, the the other con constraint on this part of the corridor is that the utility poles and the poles that give the power to the TTC tracks uh, are very close in very close proximity to the curb so it, it limits the opportunity for us to make any changes and move the curb. So the, the KSIs on this section, as I said, were eight people on uh, on this section. Uh, all of the them were at intersections, uh, uh, no mid block, uh, uh, no mid block uh, serious or fatal collisions on this section. Images showing uh, the, the one on the right uh, shows the. Uh, Shows the cycle track, and you also see how the the cars do enter into the the, the image with the car on the the very far with the the headlights uh, uh, on. Uh, shows that you know the with the with the existing bike lanes, it's there's a lot of people that will stop in the bike lane. Uh, image on the left shows uh, how close the not so much the first pole, but the second pole. They're 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 pretty much what we call at the back of the curb, which leaves no flexibility to. Uh, it leaves um, not a lot of flexibility for options for providing a, a cycle track and on this section. So what we are proposing is again between the existing curb to curb width, we will not be it won't be a raised cycle track on this section. It'll be a street level cycle track. So the cyclists will be at the same level as the, the vehicles, but separating them will be a, a cast in place curb. So it will cast in place versus what you may see on some of the other um, installations that we've done in the area on Bloor. Those are precast curbs that are pinned to the asphalt. This one will be uh, a, a permanent curb that will be built uh, in the roadway. So this is a, a rendering of what it would look like. Uh, so uh, again, the same uh, because we're working within the, the existing roadway, it's we have to pinch the, the vehicle lanes and the cycling facility a little bit because there's a, the the curb does require a minimum amount of distance between it or, or minimum distance to provide it. So the bike lanes will be or the inside the curb will be about 1.5, 1.6 meters, and the lanes beside them will be reduced just a little bit too in order to accommodate that that buffer with the curb in it. So there's no impact to the on street parking because there there was no on street parking there now, and should help uh, with uh, the, the barrier will help with people not stopping in the cycle track in the bike lane now cycle track the because as I explained a little bit earlier with the there's a little bit extra width that's required for uh, a TTC platform versus when it's when you you account for the the ramp that needs is required for loading of the TTC so in this case there with it only being 1.5, 1.6 plus a little bit for the buffer, that that extra width and the the width required for the trench drain on the other side, there there isn't any room to provide a raised platform on this section of college. So at this section, the brakes and similar to what you see again on on some of the other sections like Bloor, it will be a green painted area where, um, in this case, it it's not. Um, in those areas, the buses enter into it, which has been a uh, an area of conflict. But in this case, it's mostly that the the streetcars will. Uh, it's mostly streetcar service, and the buses will only enter when it's uh, the bus replaces the the streetcar service at, at certain times for for you know service outages or whatever. Next steps are. So, as I said, we the, you can think of it as there, there's the city policies and programs that help guide us, there's the technical uh, requirements that help guide us, and then there's the, the, this exercise, the, the public inputs and, and what we hear from you, and all of those three helps us make our decision on how we go forward. So, and we also have to coordinate, there are, uh, you, some of you may have gone to um, some of the other projects in the area, there's the uh, Kensington Market uh, work that's happening in 22, 23. Um, links to those projects, uh, projects uh, as you can see on the slide on the left. Also, the Palmerston Cycling Connections 
which goes quite significantly from DuPont down to Wellington uh, with our Wellington Street project that is upcoming. So the next steps, we, we are the, in the blue box is where we are right now. We did have a stakeholder meeting on November 2nd, so now we are at the, uh, the public meeting November 15th. So the, the, uh, I believe at the November, around November 2nd, Adila can correct me if I'm misspeaking, but I think the, 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 the survey opened on November 2nd. We're taking feedback until the 29th. Uh, so we will post the, the summary of that on, on our website. Uh, after we get all that feedback and, and summarize it, we'll post in December. And we're hoping to report in to uh, any bike lane improvements uh, or changes that have to go to uh, Infrastructure and Environment Committee and then Council, and that will happen in Q1 2022. And uh, the, we'll, that will, all that uh, the cycle track will be incorporated into the design and installation uh, construction in the summer of 2022. Great, thank you very much, Dave. Um, and apologies to everyone if I missed anyone during the introduction. My screen did go momentarily blank, um, and I was just hoping you would roll with me on this. So David has given us um, a very detailed uh, presentation on some of the changes that are going to be made as part of our cycling and pedestrian upgrades. Um, I think a lot of the questions that people have been sending in to the City of Toronto have hopefully been clarified with that presentation. But we most certainly want to hear from you this evening. So we are going to go into a question and answer period. Um, and I just want to let you know that there are three ways that you can ask questions this evening. The first one is to type them into the Q&A box. The second one is to raise your hand virtually using a function towards the bottom right of your screen. And the third form of asking questions is to send them via email to adila.valiela at toronto.ca. Before I open the floor to questions, um, we do have Councillor Mike Layton with us this evening. Um, and seeing as this project falls in, entirely in your ward, um, Councillor Mike Layton, um, I want to offer you a chance to make a few opening remarks and perhaps set the context for some of the changes that we are proposing. Well, thank you very much, Adela. It's, uh, you, you know, our city is a changing one, as uh, we set out at the beginning of the meeting. Um, there are a lot of goals we have as a city that, that we're trying to meet. And uh, one of them includes making our streets safer for everyone. And as I think the presentation clearly outlined, College Street could be safer. And it, but it's going to take some intervention. Now, another goal we have as a city and something we're going to be debating very soon at City Council is actually increasing the uh, number of people who are walking, cycling, and taking public transit for shorter trips. And this is a key, it, it, it's not just a passing goal of, uh, of our climate plan. It is a key target of our climate plan. And if we don't meet it, if we don't meet it, we will not be able to fulfill our commitment of net zero by 2050. Now to do this, we know what the roadmap is. We have examples around the world. It's make our streets safer and more inviting for walking and cycling. And that's precisely what this project tries to do. Now I, I know it's coming quickly for many people. There are a project like this, an upgrade of this kind, Normally, we have a little bit of a runway, a couple of years, we get some dialogue. It's, it's not something that's happened in next year. Um, the reason why is, is twofold, I would say. I would say threefold. The two reasons I just mentioned, and add in the fact that um, there have been requests, repeated requests from council to evaluate uh, different options for making college safer because of the, the serious injuries and, and deaths that we've seen along the street. And what we experience every day, if you're a cyclist, uh, biking down the roads, particularly in the wintertime, but also in the summer with obstructed lanes. 
uh, and it just not feeling safe for such an important cycling route in the city. Now, the last reason I'd, I'd say is that we're piggybacking on other work, right? Like the TTC has serious work going on. This is our opportunity. And it's not an opportunity that comes often. We're talking a 10, 20, 30 year horizon for an opportunity to do work like this, for us to gain the efficiency of another project to allow us to, uh, uh, to, to, to rebuild the street to something that is better. It might not be perfect in your mind, and that is completely legitimate. We are here to get your advice. Uh, but it is, uh, it, works like this are necessary in order for us to meet all of these very worthwhile goals that we have as a city. But we wanna make sure we get it right, and we wanna make sure we do it the best that we can. Uh, given the local context, context, you know it best, so now's your opportunity to let us know. I would also just add very quickly that there's likely a couple other stakeholder steps that uh, uh, at meetings that will happen in the meantime with subsets of uh, various groups along the corridor just to ensure that we fill out the uh, our, our complete understanding of the street and how it might uh, work on a on a very granular, very localized level. And we're ready to have those conversations. So if you'd like to have that conversation, please reach out to my office. Emily Wong from my staff is also uh, on the panel here tonight. Thank you very much. Back to you. Great, and thank you, uh, Councillor Layton, for setting that context. Um, we certainly have some ambitious goals that uh, David pointed out in the presentation. Um, so just the recap, it is safety, encouraging active transportation, supporting all modes of transportation, and also supporting the commercial main street that runs through this important neighborhood in Toronto. So I'm, I'm now going to, about to open, to the floor for questions. I first would like to take any questions of clarity. Um, so is there something specific that you heard which you simply didn't understand? Um, if you can raise your hand, I am going to record the questions coming in. Uh, just to the PCU team, I'm, I'm not too sure that I'm viewing the raised hands. Um, in the attendee list, so I'm not too sure if I've got the right screen in front of me. I don't um, see I any raised hands yet. Okay, okay. Yeah, you, you might need to refresh your attendee list, and then if you scroll down, I do see a couple there. Scroll down. Hmm. I have refreshed. Um, Robin, maybe you can help in the meantime. I've, I've just sure. refreshed, and I don't do not see the hand function. Um, okay. I do see the questions coming in through the chat box, um, but if we can maybe, as I said, just start with questions of clarity and Robin, I would be grateful for your assistance. Yeah, so do you want me to unmute someone? Please. Okay, so I'm gonna unmute Eleni. And you know what, Adila, I can't actually, I think Alyssa or Natalie need to. Sorry about that, Eleni, we'll get to you in a sec. I can unmute. Let me put this in alphabetical order. So, Eleni with an A? E L E N I. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh. It looks like I can. Eleni, apologies. Um, we might need somebody else. Who has the controls to help with the mute? While we're waiting for Eleni to be unmuted, Robin, maybe we can take a question from um, the chat box. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the question from Joseph. Um, Joseph asks, has TTC considered platform after intersections instead of before, as done on King. So this is a TTC question, um, and I think, David, perhaps you can speak to some of this. For the most part, though, I will leave TTC questions to the end of the presentation, just so that as a group, we can maintain focus on our primary topic of this evening, which is the bicycle and pedestrian upgrades. Uh, but either Diego or David, 
um, I'm not too sure between the two of you, has the TTC considered platforms after intersections instead of before? Uh, it's, it's Diego here. Um, I'm going to defer this question to my colleague, Christian of TTC planning, if he's on the line. Hi, Diego, I am. Um, and I am a transit service planner rather than a stops planner. But what I can say is that um, in situations such as this, um, where we don't have uh, transit signal priority installed at every intersection, um, then the stops uh, standard that we do have is to have a near side, as we call it, stop before the intersection. In situations where we have either a uh, left turning lane of traffic going in front of streetcars or transit signal priority installed. We do have it after the intersection so that the green lights can be extended for streetcars. But otherwise, for, for reasons of, of safety and other reasons, we generally do put these stops before the intersection. It also is taken into account on a case by case basis, of course, depending on the, the geography of the area and other factors like that. Okay, great. Thank you, Christian. And and I think this is something that we do see th throughout the city in terms of the location of TTC stops and traffic lights. I'm aware that um, it has come up um, a few times. Okay, Eleni, there we go. Let's see if we can Hi, hear you me. now. <laughs> can you hear me? Beautiful. All right. Okay. Um, I think you already mentioned this, but it skipped by so fast that I think I missed it. So just to clarify, what are the dates for the starting completion of the construction? I think you said summer 2022. Is that right? We yeah, are looking. But... Go ahead. Yeah, it, right now it's, it, it's just the the start of the construction season, which is typically uh, yeah summer. So it wouldn't start in the winter and um, and it will will take most of the year, yes. So uh, May June is 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 a typical start date. Right. Okay. So it would end in when do you think it would end? My understanding. I, I'm not part of the, the the construction part of it, but it it, it should be uh, completed in 2022. So start and finish in 2022. Oh. Okay. I see. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Eleni. Um, maybe just for everyone here with us this evening, um, as you're aware, we do have Diego and Christian with us who can speak to some of the TTC and construction questions, but we are going to hold, say, 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the presentation to talk about that specifically. Um, for now, if we can please handle any questions related to the cycling and pedestrian infrastructure upgrades. Um, Robin, if you can assist with people who have their hands raised, we'll take another question from uh, another spoken question and then we'll get to the written list. So Adila, I think you need to, um, you have the host role now, so you should be able to unmute people. Um, I I can unmute people. I can't see their hands unless nobody has their hand raised. Star. Okay, so um, if you scroll down, uh, Gideon has his hand raised. Okay. Gideon, Great. go ahead. Yes. Thanks, Adila. Uh, yeah, so first of all, I want to say thanks so much to staff for this project. Uh, I'm with the David Suzuki Foundation. We're delighted the project is going ahead. Marvelous. I was blown away when I saw the numbers at that western uh, leg of College Street, 6,800 cyclists a day. That's wonderful, and they, they really need that protection of a separated cycle track. So thank you for that. My only question is, could we go a little bit farther west and east? I'm thinking that it seems to me it would make sense to connect the western edge rather than at Manning to take it out to Shaw, where there's a very active bike lane, as city staff know, and then at the eastern tip, taking it just a wee bit further to Young Street, because there should be a, a future bike lane along Young. And I'm just wondering what the rationale was to cap it at Bay and Manning, rather than taking it that little bit further at each end, where it would connect up with, uh, with a really busy bike lane at Shaw and a future bike lane at Young. Thank you.
Yes, a very good question. Sorry, that's a very good question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll deal with the, the section. Uh, just to generally, the, the reason why it's capped from from Manning to to Bay is uh, again, as we we mentioned in the earlier slides, we're we're taking advantage in the opportunity while the the TTC is doing the the reconstruction work to to focus on that. It's already a long corridor and uh, a lot of work to do. It's it's a, over two kilometers. Um, we're expanding it just to the to the west to to match up where the existing bike lanes ends at Manning. There are other difficulties and other challenges uh, west of that location. So we're focusing on this section for now, and, and it will require pretty much most of our focus to, to be able to get that delivered now. Uh, it's not like that we won't look at those other ones, but it's to, to bundle that in with this project, I think would be overwhelming. Uh, and to, to go further east of Bay, as you said, uh, I do believe that's that's included as part of the uh, the Young Street work that uh, project that's happening there that uh, to extend the bike lanes from Young to where they end at Bay. Hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I will go ahead and read out a question from the chat box. Um, and it's a very similar question, so maybe we, we can speak to um, sort of the scope of the project in general. Uh, so why are only three streets being considered for raised intersection designs? All the streets west of Spadina have the same dimensions, and that is being asked by Ian. Another good question. And, and so, yeah, I think some of the ones that were identified were um, they were originally identified as as part of a zero vision zero policies for where we would consider raised intersections are close to schools. So those were identified. If, um, those were the first ones that we identified, and that's the policy is is to do if we're going to do raised intersections, they have to be a certain distance from a school. Um, we have had that comment, and so we are taking that back, and we will be approaching our our. Uh, our colleagues in, in Engineering Construction Services, ECS, uh, to see um, about expanding that scope and maybe doing more intersections than just the ones we have uh, identified that were that were close to the schools. Uh, it was originally actually more than the, I think, three that were on the slides. It was uh, the ones that met the, the criteria for the distance from the school was, I believe, six. Uh, one had to fall off because of uh, uh, there were drainage issues, so I think it was actually five that we were going to look at doing. So uh, it was a, more than three, but I, I think we would like to look at, uh, and we will be approaching that with our, our colleagues to see if we can get more than just what we have identified. Thank you, Dave. Um, Robin, do you want to read out a, another participant with their hand up? Sure, uh, Gordon, with their hand up, Gordon B. The same thing. Go ahead, can Gordon. Hear? Can you hear? Yeah, we can hear you, Gordon. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so safety, totally agree. And uh, as, as Mike knows, uh, pedestrian safety or road user safety in general has been a big concern of mine. So I want to get a clarification around the safety data. And uh, I guess I'm uh, concerned that we're, you know, lumping pedestrians and cyclists, or maybe we're not. So the safety data, can staff please clarify two things? First one is, what is the nature of the injuries? Okay, so is, is, it, is it a... And, and what was the cause of the injuries? So is it a cyclist um, that was injured or killed? Is it a pedestrian that was injured or killed? And you know, how, how did it happen? Um, the concern, as I'm sure you're already way ahead of me, but let's make sure that if we're putting in a, a really large amount of money to change a streetscape that was just rebuilt in 2004, I wanna make sure that we are addressing root causes. So we'll be, we should be able to look at the proposal and say, yep, this would have prevented those X um, collisions because we know that it was a situation of a, a car hitting a cyclist or whatever it was, and now there's separation, that's going to be good to go. So that's the, the, the first one. Uh, and, I, and certainly I'm wondering, 
what is the pedestrian and cyclist split? In fact, do you have any um, data on pedestrian uh, cyclist collisions? Because uh, you know they're pretty hard to report. The second thing is um, one of the big things we had when we did the project in 2004 was we wanted to have a curb to define the public realm from all traffic, including cyclists. And I know that you're proposing proposing to raise the um, sidewalk, or sorry, the uh, cycle track to sidewalk level. And you, uh, David, you clearly said that this provides really good uh, protection for cyclists from cars. So my obvious question is, um, what's the, is there any data available to support the removal of this curb? Um, I see uh, sidewalks uh, cycling on Bloor Street. Um, I see this opening the door to uh, impatient cyclists who want to get around someone in front of them to just simply take to the sidewalk at the peril. So, what data is there available to support that um, decision? Thank you. So, I, I believe you had two questions there, and, and uh, I, I may pass this on to my the, the first one about uh, the the. The collisions that you mentioned, uh, the engineer on the line is is Casser, but but just generally, it, it's not all uh, the collisions. They as they're specifically um, the fatalities and serious injuries, and we do have the the copies of the accident records, so uh, we can determine. Um, and they were all you know um, cyclist pedestrians, uh, and like I said, most of them are at intersections. So the um, which is typical, uh, but just holistically making the improvements, uh, as I said before, at the intersections, uh, you can't predict where the, the collisions are gonna be along this section. It was 28 in, there, there was no hotspot. It, it spread out between the intersections. So to make the similar type improvements at the intersections, uh, reducing the, the curb radii, Reducing the, as I said before, in the, the raised intersection of the curb extensions help reduce the speeds of the turns. It, it's mostly typical collisions are mostly on, on turns. Uh, uh, there's often speed involved. So if we can improve the visibility of the cyclist uh, and pedestrians to the, the turning vehicles, which I think uh, the improvements we're suggesting will do, then it will improve the safety along the whole corridor. Um, the Second question about the curbs. Uh, the the curbs, uh, from a, a design perspective, and uh, how we have to manage. Uh, because if you, as you build out, uh, and, and as you build, is you have to, uh, and how the drainage works to to make the water flow. Uh, we're really not changing the level of the existing sidewalk. So the curbs that you see, and the 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 the, the curb in between the sidewalk and the cycle track is about 50 millimeters and the curb between the roadway and the cycle track is 100 millimeters and that 150 millimeters total is the same distance as a the standard curb so those numbers are about the same so we we it's a design that's been used um, it, across the city and across many other municipalities uh, in north america and around the world um, we haven't had any i know you said you you've uh, You've seen instances of, of sidewalk cycling. Uh, I don't believe that that's uh, with the street furniture and the, the thing in the furnishing zone in between and the tree zone in between where the sidewalk and the normal pedestrian traffic is and the cycle track is very much of a turn of, of somebody wanting to use that area to, to pass there. The, the cycle track in this area is also gonna be quite Quite wide. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be wider than the existing bike lane is now. It's going to be 2.1 to 2.3 meters, depending on the, uh, on the distances, which is wide enough for somebody to pass. So, on other instances, you mentioned Bloor. Um, it's much narrower. Um, it, it's only 1.5 on that one section from Bathurst to Spadina. So, the the two plus meters that we're providing is enough room for somebody to pass another cyclist. So, uh, that plus the furnishing zone, plus the little bit, the, the curb, I, I don't think we're going to see, uh, and I, our experience hasn't been in the other um, areas, uh, that uh, sidewalk cycling is an issue.
If I could add one thing, just as we've got a bit of a silent pause there, um, it's Mike Layton here. Uh, just to, to reinforce David's point that along Bloor Street, it, hell, this is a route I travel on daily um, as it's close to my house and it's my route to work. Um, it's not a problem that we've seen in that people are exiting the the cycle path to go on to the sidewalk or vice versa that pedestrians are getting into that uh, getting into the cycle track and part of it as david said was the 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 furniture zone as much as the furniture zone is now taken up by bike parking which is helpful in that it provides a bit of a barrier um there there is still a, a sidewalk cycling as as there is on every street in the city uh, mostly i i i would i would estimate now due to deliveries and pickups where uh, cyclists take liberties on uh, that last little bit of cycling as they pull up onto a curb to uh, to pull up into it in, in, in front of a location. Um, but I, I, I would say that it's no no more prevalent along Bloor than on any other street uh, within the ward. And certainly uh, complaints to my office don't reflect that it's uh, that there's any added uh, pressure from the cycle track. Um, this gets to ju just to answer one of the other questions in the chat, because we've heard it before. Uh, about why aren't you doing more along college? You have referenced it in the downtown, uh, the downtown secondary plan as being one of the great streets. We are not reconstructing the street. The, the sidewalk curbs are staying in the same place. And the reason why we can't move them is drainage related. We are not impacting the storm sewers or moving them. To do that would be an enormous effort. And until they're ready to be moved, we cannot go ahead and start redesigning them. It would take, I, I would hazard, a, a quite a long time to go through that uh, process of redesigning, uh, re redesigning the, uh, uh, the stormwater management along the strip and, it, strip, and it would involve taking out the sidewalks as well as all of the roadbed uh, and, and, and several years of work that it would take. So we typically don't reconstruct roads until we're ready to do that level of uh, reorganizing utilities and in in the uh in the vicinity the the cycling improvement for the most part west of spadina in fact is uh is is all on the the, the same plane as the road um uh, because it's not uh, uh we're not making a huge change to it um or, or sorry this the sidewalks are being maintained in the in, in the same place and it's not impacting uh the the flow uh, or drainage along uh, along the roadway and so that's why it's uh, it, it's 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 I would say both limited in scope and a significant upgrade, uh, and I I feel confident saying both of those two things at the same time. Thank you for that, Mike. Um, there is also um, I guess there are a few questions about the curb in the middle, um, and one question that I've seen come a few times is with. 1.5 meter lanes, it can be very difficult to pass others safely. In the same question, Mark is also asking um, if the curb, how is passing going to be made safe with the curb present? And that's a very, so I believe it, uh, the curb that you're referencing is the the street level cycle track with the the curb on it from the section between Spadina to Bay, and yes, that's that's one of the drawbacks of of having that um, be only being able to provide it in between the curb to curb and providing that that uh, the separation is that everything has to be shrunk a little bit more from what it is now, including uh, the bike facility, which. Uh, it's getting a little bit of the, the width taken off. And as I said before, comparing to Bloor, 1.6 really isn't sufficient room to pass. So uh, the expectation I think would be that, you know, you, uh, in order to have that extra safety, uh, you're gonna have to relax and just follow the person in front of you. There will be opportunities in, in some areas that uh, at intersections and what I see uh, uh, at locations where it's narrower that you do have the opportunity intersections to pass to, to, to reorient. Uh, there are areas on that section where we have um, the green bike boxes where the at St. George, I believe, where there's even an advanced even an advanced stop bar for 
for cyclists does allow uh, them to be in a, be out ahead of a, of the vehicles. They can establish a position as they cross through the intersection that allows them to pass through the intersection and then come back into the the cycle track on the far side after they've a faster cyclist can pass that way from a red light. It's it's much more difficult again from a green because you you don't get that advanced uh, stop bar if you approach the intersection when there's a green. But there are correct. It does have limited. Uh, opportunities to pass, and that is one of the drawbacks. But it's a drawback that, uh, you know, I think the the improved safety of having the barrier is um, is more important than you know the the speed of some cyclists that that want to to ride faster than others. So I guess it it just means being respectful as. We drive our bicycles as we are expected to um, when we take any mode of transportation. Um, I think it's a good chance right now to hear from some of the people who have their hands raised. Robin, if you can please assist. Sure, I'm gonna go to Nicole S. Nicole S, you are now unmuted, go ahead. Hi, I also, I typed, it was just a, a clarification issue. Um, uh, when I initially saw the plan, I was wondering if you were going to get rid of the bump outs at the corners, but you're saying that actually you want to have the bump outs on the corners, the bulbs, um, like the one at Spadina, but are they going to be on every corner or just some of the intersections? Because they're a great traffic calming measure. So good question. So for the most part, the bump outs that are there between Spadina and Manning will remain. Um, we do have to cut back some of them because what happens and um, if somebody could pull up the the, the presentation, uh, that might help uh, to describe uh, presentation slide uh, 37. So as you see that the bump outs in this case, um, there it isn't trimmed back because the uh, looking at the left side of the the image um, and on the top part because that's where we're doing the improvements. Those circles are are access covers that and and vaults underneath, so we can't move those. But there are other locations where that taper from where you go from the cycle track that would be behind the parking and out closer to the vehicle lanes. Uh, Right now, that's only 1.6. So where there's the opportunity, we want to widen that, but we're not going to widen it and reduce that taper so it's not as harsh a transition. Um, but we're not going to cut it all the way back. So we're going to there's there's still going to be that area, um, and you have to also look at this as the where the tree line is. That's the furnishing zone. So the pedestrian area is actually is is further back than that. So there's we're going to cut back maybe on some of the locations. Uh, uh, a little bit either for transit stops uh, that you saw on, on slide uh, 39, or in this case, it's not the, as good an example, but we will be trimming back on some of the locations. But for the most part, we're maintaining the ball boats. Uh, we're gonna, because we have to cut them back a little bit in order to improve the, um, the increase the width. And so we have to reconstruct them a bit. That's when we would also be doing that, the, the greening of them and providing some uh, some green in them. So yes, it might be cut back, but we're also going to be animating them a lot more. Thank you, and David, um, Councillor Mike Layton, I saw you put your hand up while we were speaking. Did you want to comment specifically um, to this question? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put my hand up. I was answering questions in the in that were coming up, which I know I shouldn't do. So my apologies to all the people on the panel and to everyone watching that I just randomly answer, answer questions. I'm going to stop doing them now. Okay. Um, uh, Robin, maybe we can take another question from a raised hand before we go back yeah. to the chat box. For sure. We're going to go to Daniel K now. Daniel K, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so I appreciate, um, thank you very much, Mr. Layden, for, uh, you know, telling us a little bit about why the Great Street um, 
plan isn't getting implemented. Um, but I'm just wondering, if it's not going to be done right now, then when would it happen potentially, right? Because, you know, the Parks and Public Realm plan, it's, it's a really, really transformative plan, and I'd, I'd love to see it implemented um, as fast as we can do it, obviously. Um, and I'm obviously I'm happy that we're having bike lanes, but it would just be amazing if we could have, you know, a great public realm and uh, these great streets that are proposed under the plan. Yes. Well, we don't have we don't have any more senior staff on the call to answer it, uh, the question. So I'll do my best, but I'll be completely blunt. It's I don't know when they're going to implement the Great Streets Plan for College Street. What they're doing is currently is they're looking at the great streets that have been identified, looking at what movement we can make on them within uh, our, our existing work plan uh, as, as we look a long way down the road to uh, when we're expecting to have major state of good repair done. University Avenue is, I think, a really good example. They're about to tear the whole thing up uh, to build the Ontario line, or at least a good ch chunk of it down on uh on uh, queen we also currently have in front of the city a plan for university park well we're trying to see what we could accomplish in, and and what state of good repair work we could advance to coincide with the work going on with on with, uh, with the ontario line construction in order to help us achieve at least part of that plan maybe not the whole thing but part of it so they're going to try to as we as we're actually doing better with our cycling work is anytime we look at a road and look at some state of good repair work that's going on, be it streetcar, track reconstruction, or water main work, as we did on, on, on Bloor Street, and, and, and the resulting change was, I think many cyclists would agree, it was, it was fabulous, um, or at least a very positive step forward. Um, so I think that, that's, I think, currently the staff's tactic is to take that, try to implement the chain, the uh, the the Great Streets plan as uh, integrated into our capital plan, our state of good repair work, that so that we can have all of the divisions go in and do their work at the same time. But that's going to take a lot of time. Thank you yeah, for that. Uh, um, before we, yeah, get... like, I just like to add a little bit to that. Is is like even though we're not doing the full Great Streets plan, a lot of the elements and the uh, the the goals of that plan we're, we're trying to achieve with the greening that we're doing at the corners and, and some of those, uh, you know, improvements to the public realm. So while it's not the full plan, we're, we're, we are taking the opportunity to try and implement some of those, the goals of that plan. Great. Thank you for that addition, David. Um, I have seen a number of questions coming in uh, very early on about having access to the presentation that uh, David took us through at the beginning. So just to let you know that the website will be updated with this presentation. Um, we can expect that update in the next two days, as well for a lot of questions coming in that haven't been answered over the next two days, there will also be an update to the common questions asked section. So for some of the answers that are being given now, you will see a recap on our website and for some of the questions that we are unable to get to in the course of the evening, you will also be able to find that information available on our website along with the presentation. Um, we will take one more verbal question and then we'll go to the chat box. Thank you. Great, um, I'm going to go to Brian W now. Brian, you are now unmuted, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Hi there. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, thanks for putting on uh, this presentation. I really appreciate it. And I'm really um, looking forward to Toronto implementing more safe cycling infrastructure. I live along the corridor. Uh, and, you know, I use the, the bike lanes in the area uh, regularly. On the Bloor bike lanes, they have like these rubbery plastic kind of bollards. And I noticed in some sections along this project, they're considering putting these there. Uh, if you bike along Bloor, you'll notice a lot of these knocked down, presumably by motor vehicles. And I'm just wondering if there's maybe an alternative that's more sturdy that would maybe more adequately deter a car from entering the bike lane that could be used. Thank you. 
So the purpose of the bollards isn't uh, so much to deter the the entry of the vehicles into the the cycle track. That's the purpose of the curb. Uh, really, the because on Bloor you see a lot more of them. Uh, they identify the gaps, and those gaps are are for um, and the bollards uh, are located uh, a to identify the start and end of them and, and the gaps in them for snow clearing equipment. So they need to know where those gaps are um, on the section. And and you may have seen it in the in the rendering. Uh, there'll be a lot less of them on on college because there there won't be those gaps. There will be gaps, and and in one of our, our our stakeholder meeting that you know somebody did ask the question about you know how will garbage be pulled across them, and so we do work with our our solid waste uh, colleagues and to, to identify where we would create those gaps for to pull the bins through, uh, because that's one of the issues with the, the 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 curbs is that they still have to pull the bins through, um, but a lot of times those. Uh, those bollards, as you say, it's, it's um, yes, they do get damaged. Um, it is, uh, in order to go over them, it has to be a very large vehicle that can go over them. A car cannot go over and straddle the curb. So it would be a large vehicle, somebody that's doing loading, somebody that's uh, in other cases. And in some cases, they, it has been, and we're working with our, our solid weight colleagues that they, in order to do the garbage pickup, we. Uh, they sometimes drive down the the cycle track, so they they have agreed that they're not going to do that anymore. Uh, so that's primarily where the, the bollards get damaged is by those types of vehicles that that run straight over them. Uh, not so much the the regular vehicles. Uh, the curbs are the deterrent for for going over them. Thank you. Uh, we have received a number of questions with respect to bike boxes. Um, so, David, perhaps you can just talk to us a little bit about um, what will happen to the bike boxes if they are um, planned um, as well for, for cyclists that are making turns. Um, can you tell us if, if they'll be coming back and where they might be? So there's two different kinds of bike boxes. There's the, the bike boxes and, and, and some of the ones there are are advanced bike boxes, as I said, either to to allow somebody to be out in front uh, prior to um, moving and also to, to make left turns. But we also have um, on the sides, we have indirect left turn bike boxes. Um, a lot of those will require, uh, and we, we typically do those to at crossings of um, other cycling infrastructure. So, um, in this case, St. George would be one uh, university, but but they they require typically a setback of of the the cross street crosswalk to provide that space. They're they're a certain width, and so um, if we're not rebuilding the the crosswalk, it, you, we can't shift and move the crosswalks if the the curb lines on some of those other major streets aren't going to be redone. So we can look at them. We will be looking at maintaining anything that's there. And yes, the, anywhere there it's a cross street, but I believe it, at St. George, there's already the indirect bike boxes. So uh, maybe at, uh, at some of the other locations, we'll look at, yes, uh, in pro providing bike boxes, maintaining bike boxes. Thank you. Um, there were a number of questions that had come about the intersections, which I believe we've already covered. Um, in particular, um, there's a question about the jog in the road, and I suppose this refers to the bell belts, which we've already discussed, um, but can you maybe just highlight some of the key features of how the intersections will be treated? So I'm not sure if the jog uh, you're referring to, because at, at one of the other meetings, if it's the because at the ball boats, they, there's really no jog. It's just a narrowing of um, the distance. So from a driver's perspective, there's there's really no difference uh, in making a turn. It just means that you we try and tighten up the, the curb radius. So the, uh, the curve right now that you see is, is generous. It's very wide. So uh, we tighten that up and make it a, um, we'll call it a smaller quarter circle so that you have to make a slower turn in order to 
negotiate around that. And as you pull into a narrower lane, also you you have to do that movement slower. So um, that's the objective, and that's that's what happens. They're not really skewed. Uh, so I will assume that the skews, based on some other uh, feedback we've had in the past, uh, uh, was specifically referencing the Spadina intersection, and again the the St. George intersection where there is a skew. Uh, so we've heard that, and um, I don't think that the level of uh, Again, because it's only a TTC track work, and then we're on that section. We're only adding, um, we're only adding curbs. It's not a full road reconstruction. And when you adjust curbs and adjust the skew, that also has uh, drainage implications. Because a lot of times, when especially at the north south streets cross it, and where the catch basins are located, when you start uh, adjusting and adjusting the skew, uh, it's not a simple exercise. Uh, and it's also uh, so we have heard it. And maybe there's uh, there there's some some mitigating measures we can we can look at. And so when we do meet with our uh, again engineering construction services uh, colleagues who are doing the design, we can we can bring that up. But we have noted that the the skews at St George and Spadina are problematic right now. Great, thank you. Um, I also have a few questions with respect to signals. Um, one of them is specifically for bicycle traffic signals. And the second question is referring to transit signal priority. So I think you can maybe speak to both of these questions at the same time. What kind of signaling priorities will be in place? <laughs> So right now we're not looking at making any changes um, to the signal priority. Uh, overall, there's uh, on TTC routes they they would uh, and our colleagues at TTC can recognize that I'm misspeaking, but uh, there likely is signal priority along this corridor for the the streetcars. So that's already worked into the the signal timings, and so any other changes we make uh, has to take that into account. But there's also an overall uh, policy change to provide what they call leading pedestrian intervals at intersections. So to give before the the green for the pedestrians starts before the green for the vehicles, so that allows them to move out into the intersection before the cars uh, can move so that they are visible to a right or a right turning car so that they improves the safety and when they make those changes because essentially that's every all the cars are stopped so it it has an impact on the the vehicular flow but it's an overall policy that's going to be implemented across the city where we we do it but um, uh, I'm not sure specifically about the policy on streetcar priority routes, but if we do implement any uh, leading pedestrian intervals, we would uh, piggyback on top of that. And it typically, we would do a, a leading cycling interval as part of that too, but that would require uh, signal hardware changes too to add. Right now, the cyclists go when the, the vehicles go, so there's one set of heads, uh, uh, traffic signal heads that are required because, uh, but when you do any changes that uh, gives, uh, let's say, uh, a leading interval for a bike, you would have to provide that extra signal hardware for that. And those right now are not part of the, the design exercise or what's going to be constructed. But it is not, uh, it's something that will be looked at, uh, again, as, as um, just generally as, as leading pedestrian intervals get rolled out, we would look to coordinate that too with some leading cycling intervals to because uh, they would they should go at the same time but uh, for this project nothing specifically along those lines no okay thank you um, I believe that question came in a few times uh, via email and through the comment forms as well uh, Robin can we go back to some of the people who have their hands raised please sure I'm gonna go to Marcus V uh, Marcus you are unmuted go ahead uh, thank you. Uh, I live in Kensington Market, so I'm definitely affected by the changes west of Spadina. <clears throat> and I just want to express my strong opposition to the uh, loss of a traffic lane in that section. Uh, the gridlock is already terrible. We're approaching pre-pandemic levels through much of the core because of the changes in additions of cycle lanes. I can't imagine what it's going to be like when people come back downtown. Uh, I understand the drive for these changes, but the claim that you're trying to get people to stop 
using vehicles for short distances. Nobody does that. Like the traffic is so bad. Anybody would be insane to drive three blocks in the downtown at this point. And I mean, I was in Paris a few months ago where I'm sure that's one of the, one of the examples that you probably use as an ideal, but those cities had subway networks that were better than ours in 1920. We need vehicle capacity. The population has increased by a factor of four while the city has cut the capacity in half. This is just insanity. Please stop. So I'd just like to clarify that we're not reducing the lanes. It will still be four lanes in the, the peak hour flows. Uh, yes, it will be in the, the off-peak times where parking is permitted, but that uh, is not uh, any different than the section that's that's west of Manning. Uh, so if you consider that's where the, the, the traffic may or may not be throttled. So if you're feeding in the off-peak periods, if you're feeding from two lanes in each direction west of Manning, then opening up to four lanes, you're not going to get a, a huge benefit through there. Um, we have looked at the, the traffic volumes and then the off-peak periods and the, the the level of traffic that is, and we don't do it, we do it historically from, from a number of years going back that the historic and the the off-peak periods, um, the amount of traffic that can be handled in, in one lane of traffic each direction is, is, and the amount of traffic that's on this section. And if, if uh, again, if I misspeak, Castro, hopefully you can, uh, can, can, can jump in. But I believe that the, the amount of traffic west of Manning and the off-peak periods and the and east of Manning is is similar. So uh, again, if the, the the two lanes west of Manning can handle the traffic, then the the even if it's when there's the parking in the, the curb lane, uh, that those lanes could handle the, the traffic in the, the off-peak times. And uh, at the intersections, there's there's always a restrictions to the parking um, as you approach an intersection. So uh, at those approaches too, uh, you know, it will essentially widen out to two lanes. So if there's somebody making a left turn lane, it's not like you're reduced to, to the one lane at the intersection because there will be no parking there. So uh, the intersection capacity and they, the, the throughput at the intersection should be about the same off peak or peak times. Okay, excellent. Um, it is now 7.30 and I did promise some time um, to set some time aside specifically for TTC questions. And we do have a number that have come in through the chat box. Um, so maybe a good a good way to segue into some of the TTC questions um, will be to begin with a question um, asked by Alan. Um, and Alan states, am I correct in understanding that between um, Manning to Spadina, the TTC platform, an elevated cycle track overlaps with tactile strips. As pedestrians have priority, wouldn't pedestrians waiting for the bus break the cycle flow? So can you give us some information on how um, it is going to work? So I can answer that question. It's not really a TTC question, but no, the, the platforms and the the yellow tactile strip, uh, yeah, that indicates to somebody with the low vision that that's the uh, the area for cyclists, and then the the ramps on either side. So the expectation and how they operate, and and wherever we have these platforms, or that the TTC patrons wait uh, on the sidewalk side of that, when the TTC bus or streetcar stops, um, there they are cyclists are required to yield to the open doors so there are waiting areas and they, we do do messaging uh, both uh, there is messaging on the the, the the TTC vehicles and we also add sometimes messaging on uh, on the pavement to to yield and to stop behind the, the open doors uh, uh, as part of that so it's uh, compared to the situation now where the the vehicles and the um, and the cyclists, they, they, there isn't all of that extra uh, messaging for that they, uh, even though it should be recognized that uh, that uh, that they cyclists and vehicles have to yield to the open doors. Uh, I think all of the, the we 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 take that a step further with some some pavement markings that uh, that help reinforce that. 
Okay, so quite related to how these platforms are going to operate, um, Justin would like to know, why is there a need to have 30 meters for TTC platforms? Especially as these don't exist on other street tracks. Um, so Diego or Christian, maybe you can speak to the, the platform length. I could take that one. Um, so Thank our you. new street cars are in fact 30 meters long. Um, so the length of the platform is to ensure that uh, all all sets of doors on the vehicle along the platform, um, including the one at the very front and the very back. Uh, so currently, on streets without either bump outs or any type of platform, and it's just a typical curbside stop. Um, the no stopping and no parking area that delineates a stop is is quite a bit longer than actually just to allow for a little bit of leeway um but it does have to be that long to allow the uh streetcar to open all all four doors and for people to get on and off safely and thank you and martin asks uh with respect to the new raised ttc platforms at intersections like bathurst and college ttc riders now cross both a cycle lane and right turning vehicle lane um, I guess it's more of a comment um, that uh, this is dangerous, but um, can we speak to how the the platforms are going to work with the raised cycle tracks? So Adela, can you clarify again, that was Bathurst and college, correct? Says, yeah, um, Martin is specifically so at, referring to Bathurst and college, yes. Yeah, so at the Bathurst and college location, there's a median platform, so that's, we're not changing that. Uh, so it will be a, the bike lane and bike facility would be curbside. So how they access that platform will not change. Okay. So we're not, we're not, we're not putting the, the TTC will still load from, from the median platform. So that, that remains unchanged. It's a different kind of platform. Okay, thank you. Um, and what consideration, so TTC boarding along no parking section of college, so that would be east of Spadina, with the separated bike lane near Bay Street, how does someone with the mobility device get to the middle doors of the streetcar? So again, that at those locations, the 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 separation would end uh, where there's the existing green pavement markings there are now uh, will remain and uh, I believe at, at all those stops right now they do have existing curb cuts for for the rear doors so those would all be maintained so we don't change those so we just the way it's facilitated is that we end the barrier before this the streetcar stop so a lot of them right now are already painted out green, and that will be the, that will give you an approximate location of where the, the the curve will end. Okay, thank you, um, Robin. Do you can you see if anyone has their hands raised with respect to TTC questions? I have one more hand raised. I'm not sure if it's a TTC question, um, but it is Brian W. Brian, you are unmuted. Go ahead. Apologies. I think I never put my hand down. Oh, no problem. And I don't have any other hands raised, Adila. Okay. Um, so Lee has asked um, a question. Um, so there's construction between Elizabeth and Queens Park, which narrows the road. Um, there is also question near the Reisman Innovation Center at U of T. And um, maybe can we just have um, a bit more detail around when we might hear about more construction notices from the TTC? It, it looks like a very generic construction question of which I have received several via email over the past week. So maybe if we can just have a breakdown of when there will be um, construction notifications and how construction will be dealt with. Uh, tra traditionally, this is uh, whenever we do track uh, renewal projects, uh, it, traditionally, it is a partnership with the City of Toronto. 
they will arrange for communication with our assistance to the community itself. Um, Michael, if you're on the line, Michael Vieira, you can substantiate this as well. We're currently in the uh, design stages of the project itself, so we will more than likely initiate communication to the um, to the area uh, in the new year, early in the new year, to provide some some level of detail. And as we get closer to the actual project, we'll get more details to of the work itself. Um, we recognize that there is some um, other construction associated with uh, other parties along college itself, and we will reach out to U of T in this particular case to find out their details and their needs, and see if we can coexist as best as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Diego. Um, if we can maybe get a point of clarity on uh, Justin has been asking. Um, the platform, Justin, you've not indicated where, but the platform is not next to the track, so a rider would step off the platform onto the road and cross a lane of traffic to get to the streetcar. Are you referring to the east of uh, Spadina area where we just rose, where we just discussed the raised curbs? Um, th this question seems to have come up a few times. So, um, David, at the risk of rep repetition, um, can you maybe just explain one more time the passage from for a pedestrian on the sidewalk crossing a bike lane and a raised curb um, and if this is really in conflict or if all of these components are in different places. Um, Justin, I don't know if you're still with us. Um, maybe if you want to clarify your question, you can raise your hand and Robin will unmute you. Okay, I guess we're not hearing from Justin. Oh, I just unmuted for, him. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Justin, are you there? Okay. Well, if Justin comes I'll back, go, we can. I'll, oh. I'll, I'll go ahead and answer. Uh, uh, just, uh, yeah, uh, again, so. It would be very similar, and and if you do go up to our locations where we've done, not the, the cast in place, but the precast, um, on Bloor, the there's a break, and that they the, the curbs don't stop, uh, and then we paint the the asphalt green to uh, in that case because the buses pull into the curbside, uh, but in this case the, there's green painted there on that, that section of college already, the curb stones will stop, so there is no barrier. Uh, and we will stop it so that the uh, similar to the platforms, it'll be uh, 30 meters back, likely, so that the uh, the access can be to the the, the rear doors without having um, a curb um, uh, blocking it. So it should be uh, not any different than the situation uh, right now on accessing the streetcar. Thank you, David. Um, I, I think we've done amazingly well this evening. Um, there are just a few, uh, questions, but I can still see that that seem to be unique questions. So some of them are maybe almost a few, just like quick fire questions. Um, I have a question. Will there be a right turn at college and Spadina? Um, I in suppose, which direction? <laughs> I just lost the question. Um, let me look for it. Um, I'm sorry. I, I just checked it off as being asked and now I've lost it. Um, but maybe we can look at it from both directions. Um, they say it's a particular choke point um, for people making right turns. There we go. Will there be a right turn eastbound at Spadina? So there's, I mean, there is no- the, the A right turn lane. lane. 
yes, so the, the current configuration right there right now is is a right uh, is two lanes plus the bike lane. So it that configuration will stay the same. I believe there's a with a, a platform. We're not proposing to change that. If we did, it would just be pavement marking. Uh, and if you mark that as a a right turn lane, um, then you don't have the opportunity when there isn't the demand for the rights for Right now, it would act if there is a high demand for right turns, it would act as what we call a de facto right turn. So if everybody's in that lane is turning right, then it becomes a right turn lane. There's not enough room to provide the two lanes plus a right turn lane. So um, we would leave it as a de facto through right or a, a through right lane right now, what it is. Uh, in the where there's the, the high demand for a right, it works as a de facto right turn lane. Uh, so, I mean, the I don't see how the um, typically the advantage of having a right turn lane would be uh, to be able to provide dedicated phases, but that's a very complicated intersection already. So um, I don't know if there's uh, any advantage for providing a right turn lane or, uh, I mean, we could look at uh, if there is, uh, if as you're saying, there's a bottleneck, we can, we can look at that. But again, it would re require uh, if you wanted to clear that, then that's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it's a bottleneck because there's uh, heavy pet volumes crossing on the south leg. Uh, right turns can't uh, turn right through the pedestrian uh, flow. So the only way to do that would be to provide a, a dedicated right turn uh, so that the, uh, that would hold the pedestrians. But then, you know, you, you still want it with a heavy pedestrian flows. You want to be able to provide enough uh, green time and enough time for the pedestrians across. That's quite a wide intersection to cross. So, um, yeah, I'm sure it's something our traffic operations staff had looked in the past. I can check with them to see if they, they have uh, thought of any solutions or there's anything that um, if they, they have thought of uh, something that um, would need a project like this to implement, I can check with them. But uh, as uh, just off the top of my head, I can't think that uh, providing a right turn lane would provide um, any benefit to what is provided out there right now. Um, okay, thank you. Earlier we spoke about the skewed intersection at St. George, um, which I believe it's we've recognized as being a little bit challenging. Um, but there is also a question um, about a plan for uh, how to work with the skewed intersection at College and Spadina. That is being asked by Alan. Yeah, and I believe that's uh, the skew goes a different way. It, it goes the east-west direction versus the north-south direction. And I think it's partially due to the platforms there. Uh, and I think we did get that question in the past. And the, the difficulty in with that skew is and being able to, uh, because the lanes continue through, it's just knowing where to go when you're going across uh, uh, quite a mess of streetcar tracks and concrete is that we can't right now, there's no type of paint that we can do that will will stick to, to concrete and with any kind of longevity. Uh, there's also the fact that when you, you do mark it because of all the tracks, uh, where you put the lines also becomes very difficult to follow. Um, I tried to mark one out at, not at this location, but an intersection of uh, King and uh, Cherry Street and just it, the path that you'd have to go through it because you'd also, if you're marking it, you also want to, to mark just not the vehicle lanes, but also the a proper way for the cyclist to cross so that they're crossing at the, the, the proper angle. So it gets very complicated in, in both implementation and where you're actually going to mark the, the lane line. So um, it is very challenging. If we do come up with a way to, to mark on concrete, we will, uh, that is absolutely one of the, uh, the intersections that we'd, uh, we'd like to, to implement something. It, it's one of, uh, you know, anywhere where there's that many streetcar turns uh, where it's not clear, especially with the skew going east-west, where where we can help clarify it in any way. It, we we would if we could. Yes, I recall having this question and and I think uh, discussing this, and I believe a few of those questions have come in. Um, may, maybe just a, another very two related quick questions um, is if the current streetcar waiting platforms are going to remain, and if there has 
any, been any consideration for building new standalone platforms along College Avenue? And those were asked by Martin and Alan. So are we keeping the platforms and are we getting any new standalone TTC platforms? Um, I'll chime in here, although I'm not quite sure because it's more of a construction end of things. Um, from the scope of the project really is the replacement of the rail inside the track itself. Um, whenever there's an opportunity to extend the platforms where needed to meet the needs of the new streetcars, that's the existing streetcar islands are modified. Uh, we don't install, or I don't think we're planning to install any islands, additional islands along the college corridor at this point. Uh, unless Christian, you know something I don't. Uh, I believe the only islands within the area between Bathurst and Bay Street is really at, um, at Spadina that they exist. Uh, perhaps maybe at Bathurst, but I'm not quite sure about Bathurst, but definitely yeah. at Spadina. Yeah, there is one at Bathurst, and, and I'll just chime in with, uh, I know that there were, uh, there was at least a, a platform, I believe at Bay, that was removed, and I think the, there were previous platforms that were on Bay, on College that were removed because they didn't meet accessibility standards because they were too narrow, and so there wasn't the, the we did look at widening the platforms to make them accessible, uh, and if that wasn't possible, they were removed. So I think if there was, uh, I don't know if there are opportunities to provide platforms just because there isn't enough physical space to put um, the proper proper width platform on any of the other sections except for where they are currently. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I. My sense is uh, we've exhausted most of the questions that we have, which is amazing. Um, if you have posed a question and it hasn't been read out loud or we haven't called your name, I do apologize. Uh, for the most part, I have been grouping the questions together. So, for example, there were several questions asked about uh, bicycle lane signals or adjusted signals for the traffic plan, but um, David answered that question um, uh, quite satisfactorily, I believe. Um, so there were, um, you know, I, I don't believe I've called on everybody's name who submitted a question, but I do believe that I have been able to answer most of the questions that were raised. So just a reminder, though, that our public consultation process is not complete with the presentation this evening. There are still three ways in which you can either ask follow-up questions or submit your feedback, um, an indication of support or otherwise for the project. The first way, um, or we've exhausted some of these, the first way is verbal questions. And I've received a note from Robin who says everyone who had their hand up had a chance to add a, uh, ask a question. Um, you still have two options remaining to you. One is uh, to email any questions to myself directly. You can see my email address on the screen in front of, front of you, adila.baliala at toronto.ca. The second way that is still open and available for us to receive your feedback is through the online feedback form. I very much urge everyone who has participated with us this evening to complete the online feedback form uh, rather than just sending me a question because we have a few uh, demographic questions, user questions that are included in that feedback form, which really give us a lot of useful information, not just for this project, but for other projects in the neighborhood. We like to know how you move. Um, and in that online feedback form, there is an open comment question for you to ask any specific questions to this project. Uh, just to reiterate again, we will be up updating the website within the next two days and within the next two weeks, which is the entire um, period of the open uh, public feedback. So public, we, will, we are accepting your feedback through the form and emailed questions until November the 29th. At every important stage in your feedback or if any new unique questions um, 
come to us, we will try and keep our website updated. Thereafter, uh, we will be developing a consultation report and engagement summary, which you can expect uh, before the end of the year, before 2021 closes out. Very early next year, in the first quarter, we do report to the Infrastructure and Environment Committee of City Council. And if all goes well, uh, we certainly hope that you find a smooth installation by this summer. Um, Robin, if you can confirm that um, no one else has their hands up, I will maybe just um, pass the floor uh, to Mike Layton, who looks like he might have a closing comment. Robin, does anyone else have their hand up? Just because I can't no, see. No, we're, we're all good. Go ahead, Mike. Awesome. Councillor Layton. Great, thank you very much. And thank, uh, thank you to everyone who participated tonight, city staff, members of the community. I know there may still be some questions or suggestions about how we could improve things, uh, particularly for transit riders. I know I've been, I've been that transit rider jumping off the streetcar along college and not having cars stop. And we had a conversation uh, about that with stakeholders uh, just a couple of weeks ago about what could be done. Uh, we will look to make any upgrades, any and all upgrades that can uh, help with that situation and others to make sure that transit riders can uh, move around uh, safely uh, as we will for pedestrians motorists and cyclists uh, I, we we do know this is a major uh, shift in direction while it's not a new lane and it's one that's used by many in the city uh, it, the, the the upgrade will be significant um, we will also uh, have conversations with our, constr our our engineering and construction division at the city about how we can phase this work to, to have the least possible impact on the community. We have learned from uh, some unfortunate construction projects, not the same type of work and not the same team, uh, but on along different corridors. And we do get better with time about how we write our contracts with the construction firms that take on the work so that it's phased in an appropriate way that uh, provide for the least possible disruption to the local businesses and local community and commuters. So uh, we will undertake that and, and hopefully have something more to report as the process uh, rolls ahead. So thank you very much. And please feel free uh, as well to reach out to my office, counselor underscore Layton at toronto.ca. And you can provide us with your comments too. Great. And special thanks to uh, TTC, Diego and uh, Christian and Michael from the PCU unit for joining us um, tonight. Um, thank you. Um, for everyone who participated, your feedback is super valuable because it, it helps us be responsive to the needs of the community. Um, and I look forward to further engagement and a continued relationship. So good night, everyone.